think we are live. Just making sure we're live on the phone first before we actually start talking. Let's go, let's go. Waiting, it says waiting for Brian still, but Brian has started the live stream. What is going on? Ah, nope, that's not it. Oh, there it is. See. Cool. All right, it's live. So welcome everybody uh, to these weekly live stream sessions. It's been a month actually since I've done one. So thank you guys for tuning in. I think the, the crowd has been dwindling down quite a bit because people are just listening to me read these news articles, but that's okay. Again, the purpose of these, if you guys are new here, I just go through two different news articles or, or newsletters, one from ASHP, which is like just the most prominent pharmacy type news and then another one from amia which is typically informatics uh public health population health uh, type news uh, so you should go through each one of those just read it because i'm learning myself and then you guys can learn with me if you guys are interested so we're just gonna get right into it um and let me see and share the first bit of news which uh, is not from either newsletter, but I thought it was worthwhile because a lot of my audience is interested in pharmacy informatics in learning about uh, this, which is today is the official opening of the AHIC application uh, to do the certification. So it, they sent out this email to all the AMIA members, um, but I got this today and I was going to start filling it out, which let me see if I can show folks what this even looks like. So here it is, the AHIC, AHIC application. They want you to fill this pre-application working document, which was a little annoying. Uh, it's like an Excel sheet and you just like list everything. And I was gonna skip it uh, because it was just, you know, annoying. You, like they want to validate your experience to make sure, I think the, for my, my category or most people who are in pharmacy you typically need six years of informatics experience within the last eight years so this is just a way for them to validate your application but there's a lot of different fields you need to fill out and i was going to skip it and just fill out the application but here is the application itself and at one part of it it says you got to attach uh where is it that working document uh, where is it? I think it's this one. Yeah, I think it's like one of these. But basically I saw they had to attach that worksheet. So I was like, eh, I guess maybe I'll just fill it out and go through it. But this application looks quite long. There's a lot of documentation that goes into it. Probably take you like one to two hours to fill out. But in any case, it is very exciting. If you are wanting to be a part of the inaugural class, um, deadline is in August 18th. So it's about a little over two months. Uh, to get filled out, but looks like you gotta fill out the application and right after you finish it, you have to pay the fee, the substantial fee, which I don't even remember how much it costs now. Uh, how much does, where's the cost? $899, uh, so a lot of money. So if you're going to fill out this application and spend all this time doing it, Make sure you have $899 uh, ready because you don't want to fill all this out and then not have the money or come back to it later. But in any case, I'm probably gonna fill it out uh, a little later this week, something like that. Um, okay, so that was kind of exciting news. Um, that's the first bit. And now we're just gonna move on through, or new word I learned this month while I was on vacation, mosey on through to the next uh, topic. So the next topic is uh, latest in the pharmacy news, which is actually from today. So let's see what we got. Uh, first, leading the news, Moderna files with FDA for full approval of COVID-19 vaccine. So on Tuesday, so this is yesterday, Moderna became the latest pharmaceutical company to apply to the US FDA for full approval for its COVID-19 vaccine for use in people 18 and older. Pfizer and BioNTech applied in May for full approval of their COVID-19 vaccine. I think I've been hearing about this in other news outlets, so um, nothing novel, but good to know. 
Other COVID-19 news, FDA issues EUA for monoclonal antibody, Sotrovimab, uh, to treat mild and moderate COVID-19 in patients at risk for progressing to severe disease. Um, you know what, to be honest, I'm having a hard time keeping up with all the different EUAs they're issuing, uh, especially for the MABs, but for those who are more in tune with practice, it's always good to know uh, all the new EUAs that are coming out. U.S. seven-day average of new COVID-19 cases below 20,000 for first time since March 2020. The U.S. just recorded a seven-day average of fewer than 20,000 new daily COVID-19 cases for the first time since March 2020, recording an average about 17,248 as of Monday. This is fantastic news, and I hopefully the case counts just keep going down more and more as time goes on. Go get your vaccinations if you haven't already, folks. A uh, health equity tracker seeks to assess effect of COVID-19 and other diseases on historically underrepresented populations. So reports on the health equity tracker of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine, which is a data platform designed to assess the effect of COVID-19 and other diseases on historically underrepresented populations by monitoring multiple factors and conditions that may have influenced COVID-19 outcomes and worsened health disparities. The tracker is backed by Gilead Sciences, Google, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and CDC. Uh, it's interesting. You know, there's so many factors that play into the health of an individual or the health of a uh, population. So um, it would be interesting to see what those other factors are. Research letters suggest state COVID-19 vaccine websites were less accessible than they might have been. I think this is obvious. <laughs> Uh, anyways, let's see what I say. So I say state COVID-19 vaccine scheduling websites fell short in accessibility, contributing to the digital divide and health equity concerns that have plagued the pandemic. Someone like, that sounds like a pun there. According to a research letter published in JAMA Network Open. I don't think this was a surprise. Anyone that has, you know, registered for a vaccine probably know that it was terrible to get registered for an appointment. And I, I don't think this is a surprise at all. Um, also, there was a transition in administration when this all kind of went operational. So there's so many factors that just made it a very bad scenario. Hopefully it is better now. Uh, research suggests transplant recipients build less resistance after COVID-19 vaccines, uh, leading some to seek additional doses. Oh, this is interesting. Transplant recipients. Bloomberg reports some organ transplant recipients are receiving more than the recommended dosage of COVID-19 vaccine amid emerging research showing that these patients who suppress their immune system with drugs so their bodies don't reject donated organs are dramatically less likely to develop protective antibodies using the authorized vaccine dosage. Researchers at Johns Hopkins University found that just 17% of organ recipients developed detectable antibodies after the first dose of an mRNA vaccine while 54% developed them after a second dose. That compares with 100% in early stage trials on the vaccines. They are now tracking numerous transplant recipients who chose to get a third dose after talking with their doctors. I actually find this kind of interesting. It's not, I guess, surprising in the sense, you know, in transplant patients, but um, it's good to know. So if folks have transplant friends and families or if you're in practice this is just something that's good to know if an additional dose is warranted many patients with COVID-19 report long-term symptoms most commonly persistent fatigue so Kaiser Health reports on long-haul COVID patients who remain sick long after retesting negative for the virus and a significant percentage are suffering from syndromes that few doctors understand don't understand or treat long-term symptoms are common and the most common complaint is persistent fatigue i think this is one of my fears of catching covid is you know we don't really know what the long-term ramifications are and uh, you know if you can avoid catching it you should definitely avoid catching it right social distance mask up get your vaccines um stuff like that just be really careful um, you just don't know what those long-term symptoms are. And I really don't want to be persistently fatigued because I'm already really tired, usually. 
COVID-19 may not pose threat to U.S. blood supply safety, researchers suggest. It's not interesting to me. Drug approvals. Don't care. Don't care. Sorry for everyone that, you know, is interested in new drug approvals. These, I'm not interested. I'm probably just interested if it's like a new antibiotic or something. Health coverage and access. Survey finds most Americans lack familiarity with healthcare finance. This is like a given, right? Reports on Policy Genius survey finding that two thirds of Americans can't correctly define concepts such as healthcare insurance premiums, co payments, and deductibles. And the majority of Americans isn't familiar with basic elements of the Affordable Care Act, such as what an open enrollment is, if there's a tax penalty for foregoing coverage, and whether health plans must enroll those with pre existing conditions. The survey also found that all those 86% of those who enroll on the ACA exchanges can receive a premium tax credit. Only 25% are aware they can obtain subsidies. Yeah, this is not a surprise, right? I mean, the healthcare law and policy is already complicated. Finding that two thirds of Americans don't know what these things are, not a surprise. Um, interesting to have some statistics to back it up, though. Fairness proj project to lead Medicaid expansion effort in South Dakota. Uh, this doesn't sound interesting. Moving on. Research. Boring. <laughs> Longer term use. Boring. <laughs> boring. Okay, boring stuff. We are going to move on to um, the AMIA Daily Download to see what kind of news we have there. So this is more of the stuff that I'm interested in, right? You got your clinical informatics, bioinformatics, population health, top news, things like that. So let's see what we got. Top news here, researchers claim they have sequenced the entirety of the human genome, including the missing parts. If we know for some, maybe I'm just like dumb or something. I've always thought that they've done this a long time ago, but I guess not. An international team of scientists says it has sequenced the entirety of the human genome, including parts that were missing in the sequencing of the first human genome two decades ago. I don't know, maybe that's interesting to some. If you guys are interested, you can check that out. Uh, something bothering you. Tell it to Wobot. When, when your therapist is a bot, you can reach it at 2 a.m. This is kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if I care to click more into it, but I guess if you if you need a therapy session for free, you can go ahead and shoot Wobot in a message. Now proven against coronavirus, mRNA can do so much more. When the final phase three data came out last November showing the mRNA vaccines, made by Pfizer, BioNTech, and were more than 90% effective. Dr. Anthony Fauci had no words. He, <laughs> he texted the smiley face emojis to a journalist seeking his reaction. That's pretty funny. Uh, Dr. Fauci throwing some shade. <laughs> uh, let's see, we got our first message from Tony. You have anything to say about the increased ransomware attacks taking down full, you know, I, I um, taking down full EHRs. I don't have any comments. I mean, necessarily. I mean, I mean, maybe I can have a lot of thoughts if I think through it, but I haven't heard the news. I don't think it would be a surprise. Um, one of my classes I took on health information security last year showed that it is actually very frequent that there are attacks in the EHR space, um, more frequent than you would expect. So I, I think for one point, uh, anyone who's in cybersecurity, great. They are in great job demand because of things like this. And then two, with people who are building stuff in the f informatics space, be very careful. You know, you, you gotta be very cognizant of the things you do to make sure you don't leak any security or PHI or things like that. Don't click on random stuff when you're an employee of a hospital. Uh, but I, I don't know, I haven't heard about it. Um, do you, if you have any like specific headliners, let me know. Um, but I have I've been gone for the last month, so I've been like uh, hiding under a rock. <laughs> okay, moving on. Let's see. Editor of J JAMA leaves after outcry over colleagues' remarks on racism. So I love drama. This sounds like drama. <laughs> so we're gonna click into this one. So let's see what it says. Sorry, this is pro probably not news you guys care about. Oh, it's behind a paywall. Terrible, terrible. Um, oh well, we're just gonna read 
this Dr. Howard Bauchner will leave his post after a colleague suggested taking racism out of the conversation on a journal podcast. Interesting. Drama's interesting. The COVID vaccine is free, but not everyone believes that. Concern over unexpected bills was one of the reasons given by survey respondents for hesitation about getting the shot. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, technically it was free. I mean, I, I don't know how. Anyways, cool. Moving on. New pediatricians are seeing few bread and butter cases, but an influx of mental health crises. In his first month as a pediatric intern in the University of California, San Francisco, Alexander Hartman saw his first patient with an eating disorder that same night. He saw a dozen more. Uh, you know, it, it's very interesting in general. I, I feel as though the uh, awareness of mental health issues is becoming uh, more in the public's eye. And uh, on a positive note, the solutions and uh, resources that we have for people who and not necessarily people who have mental health issues, but just like mental health, uh, like the resources for that has been increasing. So that's a great thing. You know, I, I personally started doing daily meditation um, over the last year and has done wonders for my mental health. Tony says, I was mostly referring to Scripps' major downfall, like three to four weeks. Uh, that sounds terrible. Uh Scripps, HR, and somewhere. Let's see. Since Tony brought it up, Tony always has some good news. So let's see what we got. It is probably important to look into. So this is looks like what Tony's referring to. Scripps, rep Scripps reports data theft. HR back online, but global outages persist. Providers swept up the latest. Ransomware wave are in various stages of recovery. Leading the cyber roundup, Scripps Health has brought its EHR back online four weeks. That's a long time, four weeks. Um, shit. Scripps has restored the majority of its time has brought its epic EHR back online four weeks after falling victim to a ransomware attack. According to May 27, Health System is seeing an uptick in phone calls and patient requests via its patient portal as the network is brought back to normal operations. Um, can I skim through anything else? So, however, a June 1 update revealed that the investigation has determined that attackers gained access to the network, deployed malware, and exfiltrated copies of data on April 21st. This is really bad. Yeah, I mean, this, um, again, not necessarily a surprise. Four weeks is an insane amount. Um, it seems as though the amount of attacks on the EHR space is is high uh, from what I learned in the class before. There was like a, a specific database that you can check publicly available on all the different attacks that are reported all the time. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if I have any other thoughts aside from people who are in our field should make sure you pay attention to cybersecurity risks and build according to such. Just use common sense and don't click on things. Um, I'm probably oversimplifying it, of course. Moving on. Thanks for sharing that, Tony, by the way. From 340B to a public option, four healthcare items you may have missed in Biden's budget. So this is policy stuff. Uh, I don't know if, I'm, I'm sure like some folks are interested in policy when it pertains to 340B. So two, four healthcare items. Let's see if there's anything. Oh, this is short. Let's see what the... Like more oversight of the 340B drug discount program. I don't think this is unexpected. For those who work in pharmacy, probably know that there's a little bit of a, a skepticism sometimes of people just uh, taking advantage of it. So I'm not surprised. There's a lot of different health policy articles that have been written about 340B uh, programs being abused. Um, so more oversight, making boosted ACA subsidies Permanent. Uh, that's interesting. What is this new law? Oh, this is with the federal budget. Four hundred million for rural telehealth and EHR services to greater expand telehealth services. A new Medicaid public option. 
Biden ha has been in favor of creating a public option for Americans to buy insurance coverage on the ACA's exchanges, but he also wants one to entice Medicaid expansion holdouts. The president proposed offering Medicaid-like coverage through a federal public option paired with financial incentives to ensure states maintain their existing expansions. Huh. Have not expanded Medicaid under the ACA. Um, I don't really have enough thoughts on this yet, but this seems a little intriguing to dig into. Um, healthcare policy is always interesting. Okay. Uh, Ian is in here. Uh, what's up, man? Ian says, what is the next emerging area you see for health information informatics where pharmacists can apply their skills? Um, man, with the tough questions. I, I don't, I think like, I'm probably not the best position to answer a question like that because I'm still stuck in 2017 when I was fascinated by artificial intelligence and all those buzzwords that come along with it. I still think, perhaps misinformed, that artificial intelligence and all the things that fall underneath it is the next area for um, pharmacists. I, I don't think pharmacists are well positioned at all to get into it but i think pharmacists who make an effort to upskill themselves learn about the field and proactively take initiative to get into it let me actually show my face uh take initiative to get into that area it will be an amazing opportunity for them and they will set themselves up very well at the same time along the lines of artificial health population health maybe i'm biased as well because this is why i learned in my mph courses Population health is like the big thing, big talk nowadays, you know, it's using data beyond those in within the four corners of the hospital and clinic walls. It's the social determinants of health and how we can use like, you know, uh, environmental data, uh, water data, uh, what is it, your educational level, the neighborhood you live in, all those kind of social determinants of health and merge all of that to predict different things using artificial intelligence. You know, I think pharmacists, could use their skills to um, get integrated into those areas, anywhere that has population health. There's always medications involved, right? Not just in the hospital. So I think those are like the two areas uh, that are, you know, emerging, but I, I've thought they've been emerging for the last couple of years. Um, so I don't know if that is a great answer or not. Uh, maybe a little outdated, but that's just my thoughts for now. Uh, all right, let's see what's next. What artificial intelligence still can't do? Modern artificial intelligence is capable of wonders. It can produce breathtaking original content, poetry, prose, I probably pronounced that wrong, images, music, human faces. It can diagnose some medical conditions more accurately than a human phys physician. So what can it not still can't do? Human emotions, maybe? Relative to what we would expect, uh, human cognition, AI has long uh, than original inspiration. Uh, is, or is the bold word? Use common sense. <laughs> um, yeah, it makes sense, right? It's just that, that makes sense. Common sense. Anything else? Learn continuously and adapt on the fly. I agree to an appoint, a point. I mean, I would imagine at some point it it can develop, the algorithms can be smart enough to do it better than some humans, but uh, probably not now. Uh, understand cause and effect. Yeah, uh, well, or and maybe this is my lack of knowledge in the AI world. Cause and effect, um, a lot of the, the way they build algorithms nowadays is more of an association, not really cause and effect. Reason ethically. Uh, I think that's obvious. I don't think you can teach a computer to do that. Um, nothing novel. Let's move on. Bioinformatics and data science. Uh, WHO renames coronavirus variants with non-stigmatizing Greek letters. Say goodbye to the Indian, South African, and British coronavirus variants. According to the World Health Organization, they're the Delta, Beta, Alpha variants now. Um, I find this kind of stuff interesting. I think it's always good, especially if you're in the healthcare world, to be cognizant of what the formal names are, 
formally recognized names. I and I just realized it's non-stigmatizing Greek letters. I don't. Why did they call it non-stigmatizing? Um, anything else? New naming system on Monday. So this is fairly new. Um, I guess was were there variants offending people in the past? Oh, maybe it's the ah. Maybe it was like a when people were calling it the China virus and stuff. So they're moving away from the geolocation way of naming. Um, that's interesting. Okay, I think that's that's probably enough for that news. Mixing and matching COVID nineteen shots and fully vaccinated people is subject of new study. This will be very interesting to see. Actually, maybe not in in the long in the the final outcome of things, like go the grand scheme of things. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if this is that interesting or not. How often are people going to mix and match shots? Maybe often. I don't know. I don't know. But it doesn't seem as interesting to me right now. Studies confirm COVID nineteen mRNA vaccine safe, effective for pregnant women. I think this was pretty big. Um, I know, I, I think that pregnant women were getting the COVID-19 vaccines, but it looks like there's some more data to support it. Please do announce report results from two new studies showing that the two COVID-19 mRNA vaccines now available in the US appear to be completely safe for pregnant women. The women had good responses to the vaccines producing needing levels of neutralizing antibodies and immune cells known as memory T cells, which offer more lasting protection. This is great. Um, if, for those of you who are interested, you know, go check out the articles to, you know, look at it yourself. Um, these are pretty, of course, you know, things like this. Sample sizes are very low. 30 pregnant women, 57, oh, neither pregnant or, or breastfeeding. This one's 103. So these are very small sample sizes. Um, at least it's, it's kind of a positive to know that there's some evidence, if albeit limited, to support use of COVID-19 vaccines in pregnant women. Uh, Tony says, I recently read that AI is difficult in radiology because how difficult it is to interpret images because it can take herd of radiologists to gain the experience in knowing what to infer from image. Oh, take years. Um, there's there's two two things on radio. I feel like radiologist has always been like the poster child for when to use AI. You know the 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 computer can look through hundreds of thousands, millions of images and be able to come up with some algorithm uh, better. Not I shouldn't say better uh, or or maybe better. Some of the studies have shown that, but. They seem, always seems to be the poster child as, as a good use case of it. At the same time, at the AMIA conference in 2019, I saw how often it could get it wrong as well. You know, I, I don't have full trust in AI right now. Uh, there's there's so many loopholes and data limitations. And to like AN's point at first about emerging areas, I think there's, you know, medications is a huge part of healthcare. Pharmacists can play a huge role in making sure that data integrity is there for medications when it comes to using building these algorithms. Um, we are not even close, in my opinion. We have so many data loopholes and gaps. Um, but that's interesting about the radiology thing. I uh, Sometimes it's good. I hear good news and I hear bad news. <laughs> oh, it's nine already. Time's up. <laughs> Let me see if there's any one more article I can read and we can probably end the live stream. So let me see, Brazilian talent show mass vaccination can wipe COVID-19. I mean, that's good news. A pandemic made health, made kids eyesight worse, probably because they're like, yeah, look at screen time, that makes sense. Mass distancing still important even with vaccination. Yes, people keep wearing a mask, uh, try to at least. Um, you, know, you, wanna, you don't wanna be coughed on and stuff. COVID-19 prevention of keeping childhood disease like chicken box at bay. Adjusting Medicare payments for social risk to better support social needs. Uh, social determinants of health have greater influence on health than does health care. Yet Medicare and most other payers have yet to adjust payments to better support the capacity of healthcare providers to address social needs. Again, population health is going to be a big emerging area. If you're a pharmacist or any other like healthcare fo focused individual or informatics focused individual, you're going to set yourself up pretty well if you start paying attention to social determinants of health 
population health um, and what type of needs and skills they're needing in those areas because that that's where we're going and yeah study in, in those areas in Missouri, in Missouri and other states, flawed data make it hard to track vaccine equity. Um, throughout the COVID-19 vaccination effort, public health officials and politicians have insisted that providing shots equitably across racial and ethnic groups is a top priority. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, the, the tracking of data in general for everything related to public health is has just been terrible, in my opinion. Um, this is not news. Uh, social media highlights. U.S. COVID test positivity rate is now 2%. That's awesome. Mm. Cool. I think that is it. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, shout out to Tony uh, for all of the extra news that he added to the discussion. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Hope you guys can tune in again next week while I learn with you guys, obviously. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, I will see you all next time. Bye.